Prince Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender has the best redemption arc in TV and movie history, period. And I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes or so explaining to you why. Hello, Zuko here. It's not often that a character starts a TV show as its main villain and ends as its most liked and lovable character amongst the entire cast. And that is a testament to the journey that Zuko takes through the course of the show. He begins the show as a brash, arrogant brat who feels entitled to the entire world and most certainly the throne of the Fire Nation. I want it back. I want the Avatar. I want my honor, my throne. He is a hothead who also shows no consideration for the lives or feelings of other people. Not even his uncle Iroh who shows him nothing but love and understanding. By the end of the show, he is kind and compassionate. He is full of remorse and shame for his past actions and values the lives of others even over his own. He is capable and willing of expressing his love and appreciation for those he cares about. And he forsakes the Fire Nation throne that he coveted for so long because he feels compelled by his morals to do the right thing. I am so, so sorry, uncle. I am so sorry and ashamed of what I did. So we're going to break down this journey. But first, to understand why his redemption arc is so remarkable, we must first discuss common tropes and ways in which redemption arcs are normally handled in the stories we consume. And like all bad things, it starts with Chris Pratt. Mamma mia! The 2016 movie Passengers features a classic trope of redemption arcs, the one I would say is probably the most commonly used. I'm going to call it the redeeming sacrifice. This trope occurs when a character who is either straight up the bad guy or does something really horrible during the course of the story, then makes one big sacrifice to make everyone love them again. The problem with this trope is that this one heroic action is supposed to absolve them of all their crimes in the past without any meaningful engagement with what that bad act was and what they learned from it. Passengers features a great example of why this trope is so unfulfilling and why it sends such a terrible message to the viewing audience. So I want to talk about it really quick and then we'll talk about how The Last Airbender avoids this trope with Zuko. So unfortunately I'm going to have to describe to you what happens in the movie Passengers. Thankfully I watched it so that you do not have to. Passengers takes place in an intergalactic spaceship, one where the passengers, haha <laughs> name drop, are all in a stasis. The plan is for them to take them to a planet they intend to colonize, but it's so far away that it will take like a hundred years for the ship's journey to complete, which is why all the passengers, haha <laughs> said it again, are in stasis pods, waiting to be woken up at the right time. Except, something goes wrong. Something always goes wrong. A stray asteroid hits the ship and causes a malfunction which wakes up Chris Pratt's character. Initially, he isn't too sad about the situation. After all, he's on a luxury pleasure cruise with no one to stop him from doing whatever he wants. He goofs off, he eats whatever he wants, and even indulges in some video games. But after a while, of course, the inevitable dawns upon him. That he's all alone and that if nothing changes, he will end up dying alone on the ship before any of the other passengers wake up. Increasingly desperate, he starts exploring other areas of the ship until he happens upon the pod which contains Jennifer Lawrence's character. Of course, he is taken by her beauty and immediately falls in love. And in rather stalkerish fashion, he starts obsessing over her, looking over all the personal information videos she has and finding out basically everything about her while she's still asleep. Eventually, he becomes so desperate and so obsessed that he does the unthinkable. He wakes her up, knowing that it will mean she will die on this ship with him. Now, Passenger is a bad film for many reasons, and this would be one of them, but I want to talk specifically about the redemption of Chris Pratt's character. So we should take a minute to point out what his crimes are. He is a stalker, and at the moment of this act, essentially a murderer. He plays God with Jennifer Lawrence's life, and essentially treats her like an object to own takes all autonomy away from her and confines her to a death or a life with him. I'm not sure which is worse. I'm not sure there's a way to satisfyingly redeem a character like this, but the way the film tries is definitely not the way. So back to the story, Jennifer Lawrence, of course, spends time with Chris Pratt and falls back in love with him. Of course, the key part here, though, is that Chris Pratt does not tell her how she ended up waking up. He pretends to know nothing about it. Now, the two of them end up so happy together that Chris Pratt decides he's going to propose. And just as he's about to do so, this AI bartender that Chris Pratt has been confiding his secrets into accidentally lets slip what Chris Pratt did. Furious, understandably so, J-Law breaks things off with Chris Pratt. And in fact, 
is so mad at him that she tries to murder him in his sleep, also understandable, and barely decides to not kill him out of some sense of morality. That part I had difficulty relating to. Now how, might you ask, do you bring these two former lovers together in a romantic film? But there's no situation too desperate for the redeeming sacrifice to not be used. So it turns out that there's a malfunction on the ship. There is a way to get to the officer's quarters and find a way to put our characters back into hibernation. But someone has to go fix the gizmo in the engine room without which the whole ship will explode and everyone will die. And as they realize the situation in there, it becomes clear that fixing the problem will be a suicide mission. No one is going to come back from there. Spoiler alert, there actually is a way back and Chris Pratt is going to come back alive. Nobly, Chris Pratt's character volunteers to do this, at which point Jennifer Lawrence realizes she ugh, still loves him and begs him to come back safely. Come back to me. I can't live on this ship without you. He does the stupid thing, there's a big explosion and you know, lo and behold he survives and he comes back safe and sound. Jennifer Lawrence decides she still wants to be with him and opts to actually not go back in stasis and instead lives out the rest of her day with Chris Pratt so that they can grow a bunch of plants on the ship. Are you kidding me? Now I don't know about you guys, but this is a rather sh** redemption arc to me. A stalker, murderous, incel type dude gets the girl and is essentially forgiven of all his crimes because he fixed the ship one time. And this is the problem with the redeeming sacrifice. It doesn't actually address what the character did wrong, it just sweeps it under the rug because hey, I did a good thing, didn't I? It's like if your father mass murders entire species, civilizations and even planets, targets and tortures your friends but then expects you to be happy because he helps you out the one time, oh wait, I'm just describing the plot of Star Wars. The redeeming sacrifice is so common in media that at this point, I'm not sure writers know how to redeem a character in any other way. But to the actual point of this video, The Last Airbender does. And it does this with Zuko. The difference between Zuko and most redeemed characters in visual media is that Zuko takes the time to meaningfully address his wrongs and who he was as a person in the past. He's actually remorseful of his behavior and beyond just expressing that remorse, he takes the time to repent. In truth, this is what we expect in reality. We expect that if someone is going to maintain that they were once a bad person but are now not, that they should be able to show that growth as a person. Their actions and attitudes should look meaningfully different. But because films and TV shows have a limited amount of time, we often accept a shorthand version of this. The Last Airbender does not. Instead, Zuko has to go through the true path to redemption, accepting the judgment of those he has wronged. In a powerful scene in Season 3, after coming to a realization about his wrongs and deciding to join Team Avatar, Zuko tells the gang that he is very sorry for what he's done. But importantly, he does not stop there. When they reject his apology, Zuko offers himself up to Team Avatar for whatever punishment they deem fit for his crimes. This, in truth, is what it really means to seek redemption. Now note that shades of the redeeming sacrifice appear in this episode as well when Combustion Man, the assassin that Zuko himself hired to kill the Avatar, appears to, well, try and do that job. But Zuko intervenes, risking his life to help Team Avatar defeat him. But here's the key. This is not enough to redeem him in the eyes of most of the team, and especially Katara. They merely tolerate him because they need a firebending teacher. I mean, after all, why should this redeem Zuko? Saving Team Avatar once from a guy he hired to kill them should hardly make Zuko a good person in of itself in their eyes. In most shows it would be, but not here. As the gang points out, this doesn't make up for the dozens of times Zuko tried to kill or capture Aang or the various betrayals he's already done for the group. That is why Zuko has to do this over and over and over again. Prove himself via his words and his actions. Demonstrate that he's a different person now, which is why it's so important that we see him have meaningful time spent with most of the team individually, helping them with things that matter to them and assisting them not only physically, but also morally. Take for example the episode in The Boiling Rock, when Zuko travels with Sokka to try and rescue his father and Suki, his love interest. Zuko is not just another body to help with the fighting and he's not just the same character he was, but now he's fighting for the good guys. Where previously he was rash and self-centered, in the Boiling Rock episode he is loyal, calm and insightful. Rather than risk Sokka's mission for example, he allows himself to be captured and endures the torture of the cooler without ever holding that against Sokka. 
When Sokka laments that he's a failure and wants to abandon his plan, Zuko is the one who advises him that failure is not a reason to stop trying. And even when Sokka offers that Zuko should take the escape route and leave, he decides to stay, even when there's no self-interested reason for him to do so. You have to try every time. You can't quit because you're afraid you might fail. I'm staying. You guys go. You've been here long enough. I'm not leaving without you, Sokka. I'm staying too. What's really amazing is that Zuko is able to take the lessons he learned during his journey in the show, that of repeated failures and learning to persevere through them all, and not just grow himself, but share that wisdom with others around him and uplift them as well. His journey with Katara, for example, is perhaps even more remarkable, because in this case, he actually seeks out understanding and helping Katara himself. When Zuko realizes that Katara is still upset with him, even when the rest of the group have accepted him, he tries to understand the deeper meaning behind her anger. He reaches out to Sokka and comes to the realization that Katara has mixed her anger with him, with her anger of losing her mother to the Fire Nation as a child. And so, not only does he go out of his way to identify the deeper psychological and emotional wound that Katara is bearing, but he actually wants to help her heal. He asks Sokka about how their mother died and figures out who their mother's killer was. Upon hearing this, Katara of course wants vengeance, but Aang is against the idea, believing that killing and revenge are morally wrong concepts. Again, what I find really great is that Zuko is not just a blanket good guy now. He doesn't just become a purist like Aang, for example. He's still shaped by his own experiences. Unlike Aang, he doesn't see being good as a pure and binary thing. He understands Katara's desire for revenge, having had so much trauma in his own life, and is willing to facilitate whatever action she feels she needs to heal. When she wants to hunt and murder her mother's killer, he's there to support her, understanding all too well the pain of losing a mother and the anger that it brings. And when she realizes that she doesn't want to choose that path, a path of vengeance, he's equally there to support her. In her journey to grow and heal her past wounds, Zuko is just there to be an enabler. He isn't seeking to do anything for her or push her to conform to his morals. He simply wants to help her reach a conclusion that gives her peace. This, in my mind, is what it means to genuinely care about another person's well-being. Compare this to, let's say, passengers again. After waking up Jennifer Lawrence against her will and essentially murdering her, does Chris Pratt realize the error of his ways and grow as a person, learning not to be a stalker or to ever take away Jennifer Lawrence's autonomy and free will ever again? Hell no. When she rejects his apology, he uses the security system in the ship to spy on her and then forces her to listen to his apology through the intercom system, once more taking away all her free will and going against explicitly what she told him to do, which was to leave her alone. Aurora, I don't want to lose you. I don't care! I don't care what you want! I don't care why you woke me up! You took my life! Yeah. No growth to be found here. Interestingly with Zuko, we the audience have seen his redemption coming from a lot farther away than Team Avatar did. We've seen Zuko's struggles and internal battles through the course of many episodes and seasons, so we have a lot more empathy for him than the main characters might do. Which is why again, the show could have taken a shortcut. Had Zuko turned up, apologized and then performed one redeeming sacrifice, it would have been easy for the show to say that he is forgiven. For the writers to have Team Avatar accept him because, well, we the audience already believe what he's saying. We know he genuinely wants to fight for the right side. But the show doesn't do this. And after all, why should it? The characters don't know what journey Zuko has been on. They need to see tangible change. Just mere words are not enough. And this is where we must talk about another trope that the last airbender dodges. And this is what I call, sorry is enough. Another common way for people to be forgiven in visual media is simply to say sorry. Now, don't get me wrong, saying sorry is great, in fact it's very important. But saying sorry is only the first step. Now saying the words is meaningless unless it's accompanied by tangible change. By the person understanding what they did wrong and learning to be a different or a better person. But in many shows and films, we'll find that a character misbehaves repeatedly. Sometimes being a bit of an asshole is actually their personality trait. And we expect them to behave like this all the time. And we the audience might even know that their behavior is reprehensible. But when things go really far, when a character is really upset by this loutish behavior, there is one simple solution, saying I'm sorry. The problem is that the character will say sorry and then go back to behaving exactly like they used to before. The characters who this trope is most used with usually follow one of two archetypes. 
They are either eccentric wild cards who, even amongst their friend group, are thought of as oddballs and their friends tend to tolerate this person more often than they really bond with or understand them. The second type is the character who is perpetually grumpy or angry, potentially because of some past traumatic event or a hard life growing up, or that's just how they are. Whichever archetype they follow, more often than not these characters are men and generally find it difficult to express their emotions, especially in any positive way. All of that adds up so that for the character, even uttering the words sorry are seen as a challenge. Something incredibly difficult that they have to muster up the physical strength just to say. I just want to say we're both guys, all right? And whatever happened this morning was a little misunderstanding and I'm sorry. Thus, when they do finally apologize, that scene is usually portrayed as a momentous moment and the character uttering the words is seen in itself as a triumph, at which point they're usually forgiven because saying sorry alone was such an effort for them. Now, beyond just the lack of meaningful engagement with their crimes, the other problem with this trope is that it is often used as an excuse, a way to justify bad behavior. After their apology, the character will almost always go back to behaving exactly how they used to, and the apology is not used as any indication that they are changing, but simply that deep down, they are a good guy. But what you don't know is that while I often say the wrong thing, in my heart, I mean well. This is a really toxic trait, and it's the exact ideology that is used to justify things like abusive behavior. The idea being that no matter how bad a person's behavior might be, in reality, they're actually a good person underneath it all. Well, a good person can make mistakes, but a good person learns from those mistakes. They do not continue to repeat them and ask for a free pass because they secretly mean well. The sorry is enough archetype also usually puts the burden of redemption on the characters who have been wronged. They're made to feel bad for punishing or cutting ties with the offending character because even if they continue to be a jerk or an asshole, they did try to be nice and that should be seen as enough. It basically demands that the people who have been on the receiving end of bad behavior should essentially be the better person and be the adults while the offending person is given a pass to be petulant, almost like a child, because they don't know better, even though they most definitely do and should. I know he's a jerk, but I actually feel bad for him. And the reason I fixate on this trope is because this could well have been another way for Zuko to have been redeemed. In many ways, he fits the perfect stereotype for the kind of character I just described, at least at the start of the show. He is proud, grumpy, hot-headed, and doesn't show any gratitude or positive emotion towards anyone, not even the uncle who loves him and supports him through everything. When writers are making a multi-season TV show, there are almost always external considerations that they have to weigh up, namely time pressures to have the show finished in a certain amount of time or episodes. And in that rush and pressure, they can often end up taking shortcuts and falling into the easiest tropes, because the audience already knows how this will play out and thus it's easier for them to digest. Their expectations already have them prepared for the outcomes that follow. But this is also usually where shows end up deteriorating in quality or sometimes entire character arcs end up being ruined by hasty writing. The reason I love The Last Airbender so much is that it avoids these kind of temptations so frequently. It would have been easy to take Zuko and say, well, he's a proud guy, just saying sorry is hard for him. So he said sorry and that should be enough to forgive him. But no. Zuko takes what I would describe as a healthy and necessary journey. He humbles himself. Just because he is a certain way doesn't mean he has to keep behaving that way. And recognizing this, he changes the more toxic traits that he possesses while keeping the fierce determination and drive that makes him who he is. What's even more incredible is that Zuko comes to this realization about himself not when he's at his lowest, but actually when he is given everything he could ever want. And this is where we will explore the final trope that the last airbender avoids. This one is tricky to sum up, but I'm going to call it the greater evil trope. This trope goes as follows. A character is either pretending to be good or is morally grey. Sometimes they're straight up a minor villain. But either way, they're strangely likeable or charming. But the key point is that somewhere around the halfway segment of the show or the film, this character will show themselves to be working for the big bad villain. They will either betray the good guys or strike a crippling blow to their cause. After this, 
they will return to the main villain and expect a direct reward or just the love and approval of their master. But it's at this point that the big bad villain shows just how evil they are and they will either betray, discard or just ignore their minion because, well, they're evil and they don't care about anyone but themselves. Hurt and upset, our lesser villain will then have a change of heart and join forces with the good guys because now they want revenge on the big bad guy who treated them badly. And thus, we have a person fighting against the greater evil and they are redeemed because they're fighting for the right team now even if their reasons for doing so are entirely dubious. Again, this is another trope that the last airbender could very easily have used. After all, in the world of Avatar, there is pretty much no worse bad guy than Fire Lord Ozai. Even Azula seems likable compared to him. So when Zuko returns home having killed the Avatar, or at least that's what Ozai has been told, it wouldn't have been surprising for him to turn around and renege on his deal and just imprison or continue to banish Zuko or just ignore him like he did before. Then in anger, Zuko would turn on him and join Team Avatar to get back at his father. The problem with this trope is that it's an even worse redemption than what we've mentioned before. In the greater evil trope, the character being redeemed doesn't even generally understand how wrong their behavior was. They very rarely say sorry or promise to be better people. They usually are just the same person but now on the good side. It's again not meaningful growth or redemption, for redemption implies some sort of change within the person at least in my mind. And so what makes Zuko's journey so incredible to me is that he understands his wrongs even when he gets everything he ever wanted. Most characters have their moment of clarity when they are at their lowest, when life hits rock bottom for them and they have no choice but to ask themselves if they need to change things somehow. For Zuko, the opposite is the case. He actually gets everything he was ever promised, his title, his honor and the love and approval of his previously distant father. It's incredible that he's able to come to a realization about right and wrong when he's at a position of utmost privilege, when he has no incentive to change anything at all. Zuko not only understands that his own actions were bad, but he actually understands that what is going on in the entire Fire Nation is bad, which is tremendously difficult to do. We only need to look at the real world to see how entire nations and governments struggle to grapple with the sins of their countries as a collective or sometimes the demons that haunt the past of their legacy. It's difficult enough to accept responsibility for your own misdeeds, let alone to accept responsibility for the misdeeds of a collective that you're a part of. But this is not something Zuko shies away from. The people of the world are terrified by the Fire Nation. They don't see our greatness. They hate us and we deserve it. This is of course what a leader is supposed to do. If you are a representative of your people, in this case the Fire Prince who becomes the Fire Lord, or whether you're a president or prime minister, you are there to take accountability. You are not just there to claim credit for the glories and achievements of your people, but also accept culpability and judgment for the sins of those you represent, at least those you have committed as a collective. Unlike so many political leaders in the real or fictional world, Zuko doesn't try to sweep the Fire Nation's actions under the rug or shift the blame onto someone else. He accepts his part in the system within which he has benefited, which in my mind is an incredibly important first step. As he is crowned Fire Lord, he promises to work to repair the damage, both physical and generational, that the Fire Nation has done to the world and build instead a world that facilitates love and peace. When you combine all these factors, I can't help but look at Zuko's redemption in The Last Airbender and just see it as the greatest I've ever seen of any character in film or TV history. Not only does he change meaningfully as a person, he is willing to accept the arduous journey of redemption which involves the judgement and trust building of the people he has wronged. He doesn't just say sorry, he demonstrates his change of behaviour and not just once in one unrelated grand gesture but over and over and over again in ways that are characteristic of the new morals by which he stands. And as a leader he accepts not just his own personal wrongs but also the wrongs of the nation he seeks to lead. So if there are TV shows out there and indeed if there are people out there who are looking for an exemplary model of a redemption arc then look no further than Zuko of the Fire Nation. Thank you for watching this video. Video essays like this take a long time to make with countless hours of research and editing, all of which I do entirely on my own. So if you'd like to support me making more content like this, then please do consider signing up to my Patreon, the link to which is in the video description. This supports me directly and gives me the comfort to take the time needed to 
do the video justice, rather than rushing it out or sensationalizing it for views and clicks. As always, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my current patrons and to everyone supporting me. If there's a piece of media that you'd like to see me analyze next, then please do drop it in the comment section below and I will do my best to look into it. But that's it for this video. I hope to see you again soon for another Soak session.